A few. A, a few. Let's get into it. A, a few good movies. A, a few. A, a good. A few. Good. A few. Let's get into it. A few good movies. In the opening of his seminal 1984 novel, Neuromancer, William Gibson describes the sky of Night City as the color of television tuned to a dead channel. A quaint reference by 2020 standards, Gibson's novel combines the oppressive mixture of technology and environment seen in Ridley Scott's Blade Runner and adds a new element to science fiction, cyberspace. With that, the cyberpunk genre became a full-fledged phenomenon, its ideas permeating popular sci-fi films, television, anime, and video games. Welcome to A Few Good Movies with Zach Dame, Samer Esmail, and myself, Chris Porto. This week, we're talking about cyberpunk movies. So I have a question right out of the gate, something I've been thinking about. Which aesthetic would you rather live in? I like where this is going. Cyberpunk or steampunk? Oh my God, there's no question. Steampunk? That's the question you came, <laughs> with, came yeah. up with? Yeah. Who would want to live in steampunk? <laughs> There's definitely people. Well, it's got value to it. Okay. For me, it's absolutely 100% cyberpunk. I'm not talking, yeah. I'm talking about like, well, I guess it is living in the world, but also just aesthetically like what you'd be wearing and stuff. Cyberpunk. What's cooler, a mechanized <laughs> arm or a monocle and a top hat? Yeah, body <laughs> modifications or like a to- like a Western whip. <laughs> like what? But, like, like a pistol that's, sh- that's like actually outdated already. With well, the, yeah. <laughs> With gears all over it. I will say the world yeah. is uh, far less polluted in steampunk well, that's yeah. than cyberpunk. You'd be living in a better environment in general. It's like, would you rather live in Wild Wild West or yeah. LA in Blade Runner 2049? I still would say Blade Runner just because I, I, I think it's hauntingly beautiful. It really so. is. Yeah, where steampunk just seems kind of silly. I mean, it's just, like a, it's just like a different way of asking would you li- rather live in the future or the past? Sort of. I disagree because I think it's. I well, steampunk isn't necessarily the past. Yeah. It's like a futuristic depiction of of westerns, I guess. Yeah, kind of. So if it's like the Mandalorian, because I don't think that's steampunk. So if it's like the Mandalorian, that would be interesting. Firefly, but mm-hmm. steampunk, which I only really know. Wild Wild West, right? Is that the only movie that is it's, steampunk? No, no. There's got to be the only one they go to. Yeah, it's, I really, honestly, don't know any other one. So that's that's what I'm basing it off of. I would see someone dressing up as steampunk. It's it's an aesthetic that I feel like is a lot more common than like a cyberpunk aesthetic in the yeah, world. Yeah, I would. You know, I went to the Renaissance Festival last year. Here, it's like 75 percent steampunk costumes. Yeah, man. Yeah, I would love to go to a festival we, that's like cyberpunk everywhere that'd be kind of awesome we went to me zach and his wife went to one two or three years ago yeah the theme was was steampunk first of all i had no idea walking into it but i just couldn't understand like oh people flock to steampunk i don't understand people do yeah i mean the renaissance is cool because it's like everyone's just like drinking beers eating turkey legs Mm -hmm. like it's just a chill environment because technology doesn't exist so that nobody's really working. Yeah. yeah. By the way, uh, the LA version of this festival is called the Pleasure Fair, which yeah, is which very interesting. Hilariously awesome. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know, like when you think of steampunk, that's that's like Edison bulbs and stuff, which I always thought were pretty cool, like that kind of like lamp look. I have a couple of them actually. Yeah, I love those. Metal pipes and like big screws and bolts. Yeah. And like gears. But you're, it's pretty you're dope. comparing that to like the matrix and blade run <laughs> yeah. like you're comparing that to the coolest i'll take neon signs everywhere over edison light bulbs yeah okay i mean Fair enough. obviously the pollution's bad but again being in la or san francisco in the last few months it looked like we were in a cyberpunk yeah world. and honestly like and it sucked. i wouldn't it sucked it was bad <laughs> it was terrible but it looked beautiful but your lungs are cybernetic but... so it doesn't even matter you can, yeah yeah you can yeah breathe. We are sort of almost getting to cyber. Like we're much closer to cyberpunk than steampunk. Yeah, which I don't think will ever ever no. happen in reality. <laughs> no, for People sure. People aren't going to be riding around in zeppelins <laughs> to get to work. <laughs> no, I don't think so. But I could definitely see us being, you know, slaves to a uh, technology. Which I mean, we're about. already there. In in the steampunk world. I think, anyway, life is pretty good, but like cyberpunk comes with a certain level of life is kind of a mess. And Everyone's miserable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's sort of like post apocalyptic. Unless you work for like the mega corporations, your life is shit. But the aesthetic is pretty dope. 
So welcome everyone to this week's episode of A Few Good Movies. I'm Zach Dame and with me is Chris Porto. How's it going? And Sam Rasmo. Hey, what's up guys? So yeah, the topic of the day, let's talk about it. It's not steampunk. (laughs) <laughs> well the topic of the day is cyberpunk and is, uh, this is yes. chris's pick chris why don't you tell us why you picked it let's let's go back to the real reason i picked this let's there's go a, to the beginning i was born <laughs> 1984 <laughs> yeah. um there's a very big video game coming out cyberpunk 2077 i have been waiting for this game for seven years that's when they originally announced Whoa. it and it's coming from the makers of the witcher series so that's pretty big pedigree cd project red apart from the game though i think i've always kind of been drawn to cyberpunk stuff i love the aesthetic i think the first cyberpunk thing i ever saw was blade runner as a, a kid on laserdisc that my dad showed me i don't know it's it's one of my favorite movies of all time mm-hmm. um, i didn't pick it for this but I probably should have. The original yeah. Blade Runner. I mean, yeah, and I love the sequel too. Blade Runner is yeah. sort of the granddaddy of all cyberpunk movies. Yeah. I mean, it's the first thing that comes to mind and it's classic. It is classic. It's based on a, a book from beautiful. the 60s. Like it's insane. And the movie doesn't really resemble the short story very closely, but just that kind of dark gritty dystopian aesthetic that Blade Runner has it's sort of set the bar for everything cyberpunk Um, you see it in all the cyberpunk stuff big cityscapes pollution crime is rampant I think it's fascinating there's so many different stories you can tell like in that setting you know a lot of it is kind of like film noir detective stories that's like a huge influence on cyberpunk but sort of that that marriage of the technology with that hard boiled cop feeling, I think is really cool. Have you heard anything about the uh, game in terms of um, reviews? Uh, I mean, there's no reviews yet. People have played part of it. It's a massively ambitious game. You know, you have this giant open world city that you explore. Uh, you can set the background of your character. You can be someone from the streets, someone from the corporations. You can pick a female character in a male body. So that's kind of hmm. like the ghost in the shell aspect or the matrix. Yeah. Uh, you can have no gender. You can have both genders. You can wow. have progressive a game. penis or a vagina. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. There's a, a big thing with cyberpunk is body modifications yep. and mm-hmm. just doing or being whatever you want to be. It's a little, it's, you know, as for as dirty and dark as the stories are, the people in them have a lot of freedom that you, you wouldn't really expect. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about the through line that we found in all three movies. And Mm -hmm. it seems like there's always like a melding of technology and machines with humans. Yeah, Um, yeah, biotechnology part of it. At what point are you no longer human or, you know, things like that? Yeah. How machines and humans sort of need each other. They're like codependent on one another. Yeah. It's oftentimes pretty heady stuff. Yeah. And I think that's why it's it's such a uh, popular um, genre because you really can have these metaphor like, you know, for, for instance, the Matrix has this red pill, blue pill metaphor. Mm-hmm. A lot of people think it's about, I mean, there's a lot of takes on it, obviously, but right. uh, I think the consensus sort of is that being awake to the hypocrisies of the world, but also the, the Wachowskis have come out and compared it to transgender mm-hmm. and, and a lot of like injustices in the world. Right. And I feel like this is the perfect background for these stories because it is a world where it's not that far fetched mm-hmm. like i like i think there are scientists that believe in simulation theory and say that we could be living in one right now which wouldn't wouldn't really surprise me sometimes <laughs> yeah you create this world and, and i think that's like with the movies especially like they are really good at world building in a way that's not conventional where it's not like star wars fantasy or, you know, or like aliens or terminator it is very much like we're going to tell you the rules as you go along and then we're going to break those rules and we're going to, you know, it's so, uh, what's the word? Grounded. <laughs> it's, it's so immersive, immersive. That's what I'm trying to say. I love that part, the immersion of it. It's like something that you believe could happen soon. Yeah. And some yeah. of it is even happening like right now. Well, we should mention that Zach and I, we worked on Mr. Robot and I think I would categorize that as cyberpunkish or 
science fiction reality because we do live in a world where technology and our smartphones and social media have kind of taken over our lives yeah but i don't think it's necessary it's not not it's not they're not our overlords just yet yeah right? i mean the only but we're like the, right there the only thing we're missing <laughs> are the plugs on the back of our necks well this leads me to the next thing which is a, just a discussion about what the definition of cyberpunk and sort of like what parameters there need to be to sort of consider something right cyberpunk as opposed to just sci-fi or something else the one like little single phrase that i pulled that I thought was pretty relevant was that it's the combination of high tech and low life. Yeah, there's, dystopia and But there yeah. is a certain dystopian like dystopian right. feel to the movie. I liked that as like a one sentence sort of log line for it. Do you guys agree? Do you have other definitions? No, that's a that's a great one. And I th- yeah, I, I can't be sure, but I think that is something that came out of like the William Gibson story Neuromancer, which is you know, one of the original cyberpunk novels from the 80s. I think he sort of invented cyberpunk. Yeah, right? yeah. He's basically the father of it. You know, there was Philip K. Dick before him in the 60s. Right, but, right. But, you know, like those stories, people didn't have personal computers. You know, that wasn't becoming more ingrained in our lives in the 60s. It's kind of more theoretical back then. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. you know, like the William Gibson stories he wrote, he wrote the short story Johnny Mnemonic, which was also made into a movie. Mm. I mean, that's all about hacking computers and storing data in like brain in, in your brain, um, yeah. which is a hard drive. There's also that show upload. Basically, you upload your conscience into a type of matrix. Oh, right. And yeah. you just live your life off that for the rest of your life your body is no longer but your conscience is in this um which is matrix ghost in the shell kind of thing and it's like voluntary see here's here's what's interesting is like in the 60s and 80s like those stories were written thinking like this is something we should be afraid of yeah and now i feel like people are kind of embracing it and saying like i want to live forever even though i think it's it's fantasy and it's fake but I can still live it forever in this world that someone has programmed. Yeah. So I, I also was wondering, do you guys think that Metropolis could be defined as cyberpunk? Could that be the original? Uh, I was. Oh, oh, you mean like the 20s? Yeah. Cyberpunk. Yeah, like way before its time. Like obviously it wasn't in. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that might have that might be the original, right? Yeah, like that's, or at least yeah, like a kernel of the idea. The whole plot to Metropolis is that is is society run by robots or whatever. Mm-hmm. This rich guy stumbles upon what the robots are doing to poor people, hmm. and then he tries to have like an uprising through his own company. I haven't I haven't seen the movie in a long time, but I yeah. think that's what it is. Okay, well yeah. then let's get into the movies. And uh, since this is Chris's week, he gets to go first. I'm going first, and it's kind of we're gonna go in uh, chronological order. My pick is the 1995 anime film Ghost in the Shell. What's a simulated experience again? All your memories about your wife and daughter are false. They're like a dream. Someone's taken advantage of you. They were trying to make you ghost hack into some government officials. It's written by Kazunori Ito. It's based on a 1989 manga by Masamune Shiro. And it's directed by a guy named Mamoru Oshii. He's pretty much, when you think of anime films, you don't really think of like auteurs in that field that much you think of like a miyazaki for studio ghibli or something uh oshi is definitely like one of those and he's created a lot of iconic anime uh in the 80s and the 90s and he's also dabbled in live action which kind of maintain the quality of his anime films Uh, a lot of philosophical stuff in them he's one of the few that have done both live action and anime but Ghost in the Shell is, it's a classic. Uh, it's probably one of the most well-known anime properties of all time. I, I watched like the bonus features on the, the new 4K disc that just came out. And they had mentioned that the movie didn't do very well in theaters. It was one of the first anime films to get a simultaneous release in different countries. But in 1996, it was like the number one selling VHS tape in the US. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say this one has like more mainstream appeal than most it was one of the first ones to kind of break through wasn't it like yeah i mean in 1995 when it originally came out anime was not a household thing in in america or in the west you know anime has been around for 
decades in Japan at that point. But here, you couldn't really watch an anime series on television. Uh, you could barely see anime films anywhere or buy them. Well, I do remember watching Dragon Ball Z as a kid, but I, th- yeah. I guess that was around the same time. So I guess yeah, maybe that was. was the biggest anime. And I, it might have been the, the only series that made it over here at that series- point. It's the only series I remember watching as a kid that was anime. I think that and like Fist of the North Star was popular <clears throat> here. But, you know, as far as mainstream goes, it, there wasn't anything. What's um, interesting is that right. I don't think, you know, Samer, you're just a few years younger than us, four mm-hmm. or five. Yeah. I don't remember having Dragon Ball Z as like an option when we were the age, Chris, when you and I were the age. I only remember it? it being on the Spanish channel. Right. Because like I think it's, that it's was it in, in Spanish? Spanish? Yeah, it's, it's like huge in the Spanish speaking hmm. community. It would hmm. it would play on like Telemundo <laughs> really? in Spanish. Hmm. Yeah. So we just missed out. I think that it, it got really popular like right after we kind of like aged out of that that kind Dragon of Ball? Pro- programming. Yeah. I yeah. mean unless you were yeah. like unless you had some predisposition to seek that kind of show out. Yeah. I specifically remember this thing called Toonami on the Cartoon Network, where they would show Dragon Ball Z, and they would show this, this, I, I, this might actually be cyberpunk, but they would show a show called Reboot. That's a Canadian animation show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They had this, like, 3D modeling. Yeah, I, I used to watch that. Yeah, it really looks crappy now. Like, Oh, com- for sure. Like, I remember as a kid thinking, like, oh, this is all updated and cool <laughs> compared to animation. Yeah. And now I like I'm like wow animation is ten times better than yeah this like three D modeling thing right around then maybe by the late nineties like Adult Swim had so many like anim- adult animation yeah then you get on. Samurai Champloo yeah. and you get Cowboy Bebop and, yeah. which I watched they're all cyberpunk somewhat young Cowboy Bebop is uh, kind of yeah uh, yeah I guess Cowboy yeah I guess that is cyberpunk yeah I mean yeah. that's like the late nineties early two thousands at that point it's already taken off. So my question, the thing about Ghost in the Shell is that it's there's so many iterations of it. Yeah. And I got a little confused about like where this movie fell into things until I read mm-hmm. up on it later. So there was the manga, right, that had been well established. And then this movie came out that was only really taking certain elements or like certain storylines for this movie. Is that right? Yeah. And then the film it's actually kind of its own thing. It's got some elements of the manga. Not a lot of it, though. The creator of the manga kind of he has this way of adding humor and stuff and like the goofy things that you might equate with anime. And that's like completely gone from the movie. There's none of that stuff. Hmm. <laughs> there's there's multiple series that came after this movie. Uh, the movie got yeah. the movie itself got a direct sequel in like 2004 from the same director. And there's a couple different series. And, and now there's a brand new Netflix show that's all computer generated animation that Mm. I heard isn't very good. Oh, is it out? Yeah, it's it's been out for a couple months now. Oh, interesting. But you know that how that the, just kind of tells that? you like how popular this is and just the appeal that it has. Would people consider the movie the biggest, best critically acclaimed part of the whole series? Like, I think uh, is the show better? Is the mount is the are the mangas better? I think what most fans will go between is the the film and then the series called Standalone Complex, which is. Uh, pretty okay. pretty popular it came out after the sequel movie i'm pretty sure it is very good i think for me i'd rather watch the movies i really like hand-drawn animation and there's something about yeah. the fluidity of the movement where it looks like it is a person moving and you see the grain because it's actually shot on film there's no digital tinkering here except some of those like computer overlays and things like that <laughs> the 2.0 version of yeah don't movie. watch that you told me to stay that. away from oh, it yeah. yeah everyone don't watch the 2.0 version it, like it replaces scenes with like full cgi and it doesn't look good at all i put it on it, just to see what you meant and you're right like it was like the opening it is jarring like the best especially the opening yeah because you think the whole movie will be like that mm-hmm. and then it cuts to the animation again and you're like oh <laughs> yeah it's like two different they just styles. like fill in scene it, it, that's so bizarre to me yeah do you want to do like the the plot synopsis? synopsis because yeah, frankly yeah. i was lost a good portion of the movie <laughs> yeah i i've seen this so many oh. times but um it is it's it's hard to follow i think it assumes you know a little bit about the background of it i think in a way if you watch the american hollywood version the live action one it kind of helps understand this a little more even though that movie's like severely dumbed down and less philosophical than the anime i will say i had no i had no problem 
understanding this movie and i remember the american movie the one with scarlett johansson being so like just boring mm. i can get why people are confused by it but i think i understood it yeah for the most part yeah so the movie takes place in 2029 it's less than 10 years away it takes place in a fictional city it's called newport city it's kind of based on japan it's it's more based on Hong Kong, but it's sort of a melding of the two. Fun fact, they shot some of the live action one in Hong Kong. And it, it involves uh, Major Motoko Kusanagi. She's the leader of Section 9. They're kind of like a cyber terrorist elite group that works for the government. And she works under the chief Aramaki, who's the old guy with the white hair. Motoko is a ghost in the shell. And what that means is she is a consciousness inhabiting a robotic body a completely robotic body yeah totally cybernetic body right. uh, because there are a lot of body modifications in the movie yeah. so a lot of people are cyborg like almost I everybody mean, on they kept calling her a cyborg but i always thought a cyborg was a mix of yeah. human and yeah i think that so th- because because she has a human consciousness maybe that counts makes her a cyborg okay but um yeah i mean she is fully cybernetic her partner bato yeah. He has like cybernetic eyes and some other implants right. and stuff. The team is a bunch of different uh, levels of cybernetic implants. Togusa is the ex cop that starts working for them. He's like totally old school. He has no implants. He uses like a revolver. <laughs> so <laughs> he's like the old school cop on the team. The chief doesn't have any cybernetic enhancement. But yeah, Motoko is like completely cybernetic. And I think what's interesting about the movie is she's in for all intents and purposes, a female body, but you don't know if she's actually a female. Right. It could just as well be a man. She never really presents as outwardly female. She's like super tough, no nonsense. I think that's pretty fascinating. I, I feel like that's like a huge influence on the new cyberpunk game. You know, just in general, like this movie was a huge influence on the Matrix. I'm sure you guys probably know that. I mean, there's like a couple of things right out of the gate, like the they have like similar like green number yeah. coding. The code that's is straight out of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> directly taken from this. They also talk about simulated experiences in this movie. Yeah. And they can jack into people's minds. The holes in the back of her head that yeah. you can jack into. Mm-hmm. So uh, I didn't even I didn't even talk about the plot, did I? No, keep yeah. going. <laughs> <laughs> I so I wanna clarify though that by the end of the movie I did understand what was going on. But Mm -hmm. it was just like the whole process of getting there was just so full of this dense information and like detail, details, details that didn't really, it just muddied the water. The process of getting there just felt like it was a lot of work. It's very dense. But by the time you get to it, it's like, oh, this is a really good concept and it it invokes a lot of thought provoking conversations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like, man, it is dense and full of details to get there. At yeah. some point, I'm like, I don't know what their missions and goals are. Yeah. And one of, one of the things about this movie, and I've, I've seen it in multiple places, they talk about it on those special features I mentioned. They're like, this isn't a movie you watch. It's a movie you study. <laughs> and I think that's totally <laughs> accurate because there's so much in this film story wise and just like even from an animation standpoint, if you mute it, look at the visuals. It's incredible. Yeah, there's that scene right in the middle is just they're drinking beers on a boat and then suddenly yeah. it's just there's like a, a weird somebody's talking and she freaks out and then it just cuts mm-hmm. to a bunch of like shots at the city and then they or just you, move on. They don't explain it. They just move on to the next thing and that's it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's 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 world building. It's crazy. And, you know, the music, too, is a huge part of it. I think the music is fantastic. Yeah, the music is amazing. Uh, so Section 9, they sort of investigate cyber terrorism and things like that. There's a character called the Puppet Master. He can hack into people's brains and control them and use them to commit crimes. What you discover is that he was actually created by Section 6, which is another branch of the government. They use him for political gain and stuff like that. And then, you know, eventually he combines with Motoko and they inhabit the same shell at the end of the movie. And I just gave up the whole thing, but... You just you just yada yada <laughs> over the best part. You just yada yada. Yeah, you did. I mean, you did yada yada over most of it. But that is like I don't the, want to recount the, the whole story. But that is like the basic premise is like they're trying to find this hacker, mm-hmm. and then they find out the hacker was created by this 
by Section Six mm-hmm. to you know uh, hack into people's brains and create uh, create have political gain. And then you realize that that uh, it, the, right he never existed. He's completely AI. Yeah, yeah, he's an AI. But it's not even like AI because they gave him, didn't they give him memories that he somehow fig- didn't real like forgot. I'm gonna assume they were f- false. Right, mm. they gave him false memory. See, I wonder. Well, I guess that is because I thought he did say something about not being artificial. Uh, he was trying. I, I remember that something about like he's even more than AI. He's something different. Like in in better. yeah, maybe it's just the idea that what is what is actually intel. And this is like the whole. This is the the point of the movie mm-hmm. is what it what it actually means to be a person. Yeah, and or a ghost or you know, right? Is it just like you have these memories? Because you can install memories into anything, right? right? Yeah. So is it memories? Is it is it autonomy? Is it? And then you start to realize like the there really is no difference between a person and a machine, right? Yeah. Like, isn't and there then, a whole then, discussion about like can you create a like a ghost or can you create a consciousness from scratch like without being born, like being a real mm-hmm. right. person? Yeah. And that's sort of what this bad guy is, right? Like, yeah, it turns out. Yeah. The big reveal at the end is that this puppet master, he wanted her to plug in, right? Because that's how he was going to yeah. get to join, right? So it was all a big ruse to get her to do exactly what she does, which is to right. like, plug in and see what he's all about. And mm-hmm. then he's got he's got her at that point. Which I think is an ongoing theme with cyberpunk. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think the thing about the anime yeah. is it, it asks a lot of questions. But it doesn't answer all of them. And I don't know if you... It does. Yeah, it, 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 I don't think it needs to. I think the point of it is to actually want they want you to ponder over yeah. these questions about what it actually means to be and, uh, yep. human and what it means to be a machine. And that's the failing of the live action one is they do yeah, sort of exactly. answer, they try to answer. They answer everything. They explain everything. It's a hard sell for a big budget Hollywood movie. That's true. To sort of end on the note that the anime does, which is that. Uh, she wakes up and she's in a new shell, right? Right, she's a younger, younger like girl. a child. And do they ever outright say like that the puppet master is in there too, or are they just sort he of is. like fully blended together? I think what I came out of it was that it doesn't matter. Yeah, like I think the question the show is at, or the movie is asking is like, what is the difference between humans and machines? Mm. And then at the end, you realize there really is no difference. Mm. And who cares if I have this person's memory or this person's memory? I'm still just going to exist as this thing. But uh, so wait, I have a few questions because mm. uh, this is where we can get philosophical. Because I, I, in the beginning, the puppet master hacks a garbage truck driver yeah. and leads him to believe that he was married and has a child and they are and the wife wants a divorce, yeah. but it never happened. The whole idea was to create this memory, so he would drive the truck. Well, he would do um, those hacks every like stop, right? That he thought he right. was doing it uh, to help himself, but it really had nothing to do with that goal at yeah. all. I guess it's, it's sort of a movie trope that's used often. Yeah, where you're not changing someone's idea just by telling them you're actually changing their consciousness. What? Let me ask you guys a question because I think this is the first thing that I thought of. What makes you think that what we're experiencing now isn't that, isn't just a simulated experience? In, in Jesus, real life? Man. Oh, boy. I mean, philosophers have spent their whole lives trying to like work guess, out that question, right? Like, there's a whole I guess st- the problem is that we, we'll never know until yeah, uh, the end. It's literally like we don't know that we're in a simulated experience until we actually ask ourselves the question, is this reality or not? Mm-hmm. That's like that's that's what I came to. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I realized. I ask like, myself that every morning. Is th- is this real or not? And if I don't ever think about that, then I'll just blissfully believe that I'm a simulated experience, or I'm, I'm in a simulated experience. But if I do keep asking myself, I'll get closer and closer. At least I think to what is reality. Reality is what you make it. There's literally there's no answer to that question. Yeah, <laughs> there's no like, answer to that question. If a tree falls in a forest and no one's there to hear it, kind of. I shit. mean, I wasn't expecting you guys <laughs> to be like, oh, because you know the sky's blue. We solved that it. Makes, <laughs> that makes it. Uh, we solved you know, the universe, like, guys. It's like Cypher it says day. in the first Matrix: "Ignorance is bliss." Ignorance is bliss. Yeah, there, you'll never know. We'll never really have an answer to that. All you can really do is enjoy. What you what you do have? 
if there if I had one body well, that's a question I should ask you guys if you could only have one body modification and dick jokes aside what would it be and I think for me it would be the ability to speak and understand every language oh that's a good so one. I could watch that's this a really movie and and actually truly understand it because every every Without you subtitles. know every subtitle or whatever uh, translation is going to be lost mm-hmm. so the ability to know all of it I don't know if you can if you can do that as a upgrade to your body, because that's like saying, I wish I had a cyclopedic memory or that I had all of the knowledge. I mean, in the world it, in it my could brain. be an implant in your brain. So that counts. What's interesting, Zach, is that Elon Musk is trying to develop a chip that basically works as the internet. So you can Google things in your just brain. By translate. Oh boy. Good luck testing that one. Do you remember the video of him throwing that brick through that car that was supposed to be shatterproof? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'd I like do. to see him test this on somebody's brain. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for me, it, it would be eyes. I would have eye implants. You already have eyes. Just so you can see better. <laughs> Just so you can see better. Well, yeah. I mean, I've had glasses since second grade, and, <laughs> you know, to take. Oh. So wait, you just want to see better or do you want to see like x-ray? I mean, it'd be cybernetic eyes so I could see whatever I want, really. Maybe I could zoom in on things. Maybe I could see in the dark. Maybe I would do something strength related. Super strength, stronger arms, stronger. No fatigue. No fatigue. There is a cool thing that she taught that the major talks about where because they're drinking beers on the boat, Mm -hmm. her, her system can break down the alcohol so she doesn't get a hangover yeah but i wonder if she well the thing is is like i don't then i don't think she would get drunk or I what would be she, the point of drinking? she says she doesn't get drunk she says that she could basically drink however much she wants because it'll just run right through her system and she can go to work if she has to so yeah. it's kind of like okay well, so you're just drinking all this beer well, for the taste yeah that's like then just drink some water like, <laughs> i guess like unless you really like the taste of beer yeah. then just i don't know limit yourself i will say this about the remake it has incredible visuals. They did a lot of shot for shot scenes from the anime movie that look amazing in live action. My favorite part is the end of the movie where she's ripping that tank open and her arms rip off because she's using so much strength that her arms tear off. Her back like is they, like bulging. They did that in the movie and it was oh so God. cool. And that, that fight scene in the water with the uh, holographic cloak on, you know, they did a shot for shot version of that that's very cool. Mm. Uh, yeah. And the music, they retained a lot of the soundtrack or the score, and it's pretty awesome. That's cool. Um, it's funny because this movie has a lot to actually talk about, and I don't, I don't, I don't think we even scratched the surface. Oh, yeah, so barely. The way we design this podcast is to not go in super depth with these movies, but just to give you enough so that you guys can watch it. So seriously, watch this movie. It, it is important. It's it's not just a good movie, but it's actually an important movie to watch and to kind of get because. It does ask the questions, philosophical questions of who we are and what what we actually do. It certainly has also influenced so many things that came after it. Like yeah, clearly for sure. it's sort of a trendsetter. Yeah. And Zach said it influenced the Matrix, which is what I picked. Not the Matrix original, but the Matrix reloaded. I killed you, Mr. Anderson. I watched you die with a certain satisfaction, I might add. And then something happened, something that I knew was impossible, but it happened anyway. You destroyed me, Mr. Anderson. Because we wanted a challenge. We wanted <laughs> Matrix would be easy. <laughs> Matrix well, 2 is a uh, different story. Well, here's what I'll say, because I do think people think the sequels ruin the uh, original. And I don't think that's the case. I don't think they're perfect movies. Uh, I think Matrix Reloaded might be the better of of the trilogy of the the two sequels. Oh yeah, for sure. But first of all, let me let's just briefly run down the Matrix. Neo is uh, <laughs> a hacker in in just nineties uh, New York or wherever. Chicago. Chicago. They never name the city, do they? No, but it has Chicago street signs because that's where the Wachowskis, Wachowskis are, are from. from. There, yeah. Okay, so he um he finds this person named Trinity and follows this rabbit. Blah 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 and realizes that uh there's a world beyond what he has experienced and what he is actually living is called the matrix which is developed by these spoiler machines alert for that, absolutely nobody 
<laughs> there should be a spoiler alert for the whole show. But if you haven't seen The Matrix yet, you maybe shouldn't be listening to this podcast. Yeah, I mean, if you haven't seen this The Matrix, too advanced. don't watch The Matrix Reloaded because it won't make any sense. But Start with the third um, one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he finds out that The Matrix was developed by machines to basically use humans as batteries and put them in the simulated experience where they think they're in 90s... Uh, the world i guess Mm -hmm. that's like the because that's like the peak of society it's essentially (laughs) a video game yeah it's so funny that they say like oh yes the peak of civilization was the 90s 1999 (laughs) baby (laughs) so then he's at then he's asked by morpheus played by Lawrence fishburne to to continue living this lie in the matrix the simulated experience or to escape it and realize the real world is is much crueler and darker and humans are basically extinct he picks the red pill obviously and goes through these hoops and finds out that he's actually the one to save humanity from these machines that's where two takes over i mean so that is a perfect movie i mean that is a masterpiece filmmaking experience everyone who hasn't seen the matrix should see it but that movie if you've ever watched any sci-fi, Star Wars, or like I, I just recently watched Dune, in the beginning, there's always a crawl or someone explaining this world or whatever. In the beginning of The Matrix, they don't do any of that. Mm. They just walk you through it. So you're walking with Neo, realizing the world, but he's also the one that's going to save the world. So it's very interesting. I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> so in Reloaded... The Reloaded is like episode four of Star Wars, right? You're dropped into this world, but because the movie, The Matrix, already exists, you don't need that crawl or someone explaining the whole world because it's it's already in a movie and it's a great movie. Yeah. Also, I I so, believe that people say that like that first movie is the perfect example of the hero's quest, right? Oh yeah, that, that, for sure. That is, like, what you're seeing is like the very basic story that's kind of been around forever. Yeah, I don't necessarily know if they had a trilogy in mind at first. I don't, it doesn't I, you know, seem I, like it. I mean, one ends, it kind of is a perfect ending. Yeah, it's perfect. Right, but I think it it still asks the questions, well, what do they do in the Matrix? Right? Like, there are some, obviously, there's some unsolved, there's un- unresolved issues. Yeah. So, I think two and three makes sense. Yeah. I don't know about four, which huh. they're filming, or they it's were It's totally filming. just an adult, you know, cyberpunk Harry Potter. You realize this, right? <laughs> Everything's Harry Potter. <laughs> I mean, Morpheus is Dumbledore. Okay, come yeah. on, think. <laughs> Trinity's Hermione. Um, Trinity, yeah, there's the yeah. three. That's the, there's three of them. And then, of course... Cypher is Malfoy. Yeah, Cypher is Malfoy. <laughs> and then Hogwarts is... The Nebuchadnezzar. The Matrix? <laughs> the Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, the Nebuchadnezzar. No, it's the city. It's the city. I'm... <laughs> it's it's Dude, Zion. Zion. Zion, man, so, living in that world must suck. It looks awful. <laughs> I don't... I don't want to live there. Yeah, you you guys talk you know, about you love cyberpunk, but you don't want to live in that environment. Well, well that's not cyberpunk though. That's reality. Yeah, the cyberpunk. The Matrix is cyberpunk. It, yeah, and I would love and I lived there. Yeah. <laughs> so when we get into Matrix Reloaded, we're dropped in as Neo being the one, and he has to fulfill his prophecy to save humanity, and he gets his pro- he gets his prophecy from the Oracle, which is a program. In the, that is programmed by the machines in the Matrix mm-hmm. to tell Neo, who is also a program designed to basically save the Matrix from failing. And that is like kind of the whole point of the movie is that machines need humans to run the machines and the humans need the machines for their own life, for to their own sustenance their own and yeah. lights and whatever. And it's this like symbiosis that they have that runs the matrix well now the the machines have kind of taken over and that they've just tricked everyone into thinking to into doing these things but neo realizes it and this is this is where it kind of it goes off the rails the only other thing i want to say about this movie is that the way they talk to each other is just in riddles and in, in it's not like how anybody would ever if you had someone if you knew someone that talked like this <laughs> you would find them annoying a new friend. And would yeah, never, like, yeah, shut up a <laughs> they're never clear like they're always vague about stuff and, and it's always like well you'll know when the time comes so mm-hmm. it's like we're not going to tell you any and that is kind of the the way they build this world because we don't know i mean this is almost like a, a perfect thriller as well even i guess it's an action movie but we really don't know what's going to happen next. Don't know why he needs a key master. Don't know why the key master is just 
some old dude <laughs> making keys <laughs> the old fashioned way. Yeah. It, it, it's just like such a bizarre world. And I think they pull it off because the dialogue is bizarre and it's not how people talk to each other. Yeah. It's just that there's, there's nothing like this, even though it is influenced yeah. by a lot of things. There's, there's really no other movie series that even resembles the matrix. In Ghost in the Shell, it's very similar to that because the way they talk, it is expository and they don't necessarily talk like they're buddies. And that's what I'm getting the sense with Cyberpunk is that they build the world through the dialogue because the world is actually so vast and mysterious that you really need people to explain it, but explain it in a way that makes you think and not just like, this is, you know, this is body modification. This is blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I think that's where people got lost with Matrix Reloaded. And I think that's why they didn't then see the third one. <laughs> right. I, I think I, the know. architect scene is where people started to tune out. Yeah. That's a tough one. <laughs> but, I don't know why. I, which I thought to that me was is the like one. one of the best scenes in the whole trilogy. I do like it. Like I did like, I, I really appreciated it watching it this time. But just to double yeah. back on the whole, the way that people communicate in cyberpunk movies, I was just thinking that, is it also partially because in the cyberpunk worlds, there's like everyone sort of weirdly disconnected from each other? Technology is sort of in the way of everyone connecting. Yeah. So people don't talk there's to a... each other as friends. It's just more of this dry communication with others. There's sort of a disconnect between people. Plus, you got to think like all the information that they're taking in all the time. Right. It's got to, yeah. It's kind of, it is almost how too you much. think and speak. Yeah, it's almost too much. And oftentimes there's a lot of like loners and there's a lot of people who are just like doing their own thing. And in, in The Matrix Reloaded, uh, Neo, the, the Oracle tells Neo to find the key master who's guarded by this person, the Frenchman. I can't actually remember. The Merovingian. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> however you say that. that. Means. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who is just a program, another program in The Matrix that just became uh, its own thing. Mm hmm. And he just like created this like mansion where he's like having these fancy dinners and like has cakes that can give women orgasms. Like he's just like a super horny dude that has like made this world uh, his also, own. Also, I love that they basically explain away any supernatural thing in our world as just a, a yeah. program that kind of a rogue goes, hey, program. Yeah, rogue programs that right. aren't functioning right. properly. So like Bezos would be a rogue program <laughs> that has. He, was, he would be the, like... the Merovingian. Yeah. <laughs> I think what I like um, what I like about the second one especially is, you know, being such a huge gamer, everything in it is a video game. Yeah. Yeah. Not a four -four uh, game, yeah. You know, like Yeah, it's missions. It's the whole mission thing. The Oracle is like a quest giver. <laughs> He's gotta defeat bosses. You have the, the agents are your anti your antagonists, the, the bad guys. Uh, Smith is like the end boss. You know, he has to go to different locations to find different items to use and uh, fight these like sub bosses, which are like those right. the twins and, and those other guys in the chateau and just all the NPCs he has to interact with and talk to. And that's where he's getting that like convoluted dialogue from. It's like you're jam yeah. you're jamming the A button to get the architect <laughs> to shut the hell up. <laughs> <laughs> but like like a video like you accept these things in a video game. I, I you accept it in this movie or or you don't and no, you don't. maybe it's not your thing. I think the, there's always a drive and I th like in, even in Ghost in the Shell there's a drive to find out who the puppet master is. Yeah. And Matrix Reloaded the drive is not necessarily clear because you're thinking like oh he needs to destroy the Matrix. But the drive in Matrix Reloaded is to not have Trinity die. Mm -hmm. There's puzzles you to solve. you realize that right in the beginning. And it's almost just, it's just like a dream. And you think it's like a, supposed to be an aside. But that actually is the point of the movie is to not let Trinity die. Yeah. Which is fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> so when he meets the architect, which is the source, which is what the Oracle tells him to do, um, he realizes that the architect uh, gives, gives him two options to reload the matrix because that is his reason for existing that's what the one does and he's the fifth he's the, the sixth, sixth one, one yeah, yeah. It's, it's been done five times he's the sixth the one until the fourth and their movie. whole mission is to just reload the matrix for a newer iteration yeah and he decides to not do that and to save trinity and doing that is potentially going to destroy 
the matrix and Zion. Well, that's the threat. Right? They're like, if you do that, not only are we going to destroy the matrix, we're just we're going to finish destroying Zion and humanity. And you're just going to be extinct. That's right. it. So it's like right. it's a choice, but they're really trying to make it be no choice at all because right, it's right. like, are you, you going to save humanity or just let us kill all of you? It's it's uh, considered a double bind mm. in, uh, in the psych world. Nice. Learn that from my sister in law. <laughs> Um, <laughs> is it the whole? Is it the um, train? Is it the train scenario where you let five people you don't uh, yeah, know I guess die, that or is one a, person? It's basically you do a rock and a hard place. <laughs> like, yeah, it, but it is basically that the train dilemma. Well, I, I, that one's that one's a different philosophical dilemma because it's do you save one or many? Right. This is just like you actually don't really have a choice, and you can't. Right. You, you're just screwed. Yeah, <laughs> it's a rock and a hard place. But Neo creates a choice, and that's not what the one is supposed to do. Uh, when he when he goes back to Zion, he somehow is able to use his mind to stop machines, which he's not supposed to do in the real world. Which that yeah, that's that's like a huge revelation. Reveal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, revolution! Oh. Like the third movie. <laughs> At some point, Agent Smith has become a, a his own rogue program mm-hmm. and found finds a way to duplicate himself into anyone uh, except Neo for whatever reason. Well, he's and able to stop it somehow, overpower him. He duplicates himself into Bane, which is a person from Zion. Or he was on the Nebuchadnezzar. Was, was he on the Nebuchadnezzar? No, he was on a. He was on a different ship. Different ship. Was that his name, Bane? I thought it was. I don't remember. That subplot was sort of like. It, such an afterthought that sets up the third movie it was such a hokey thing to end oh my on. god yeah like yeah. ooh, he survived no well, shit it is interesting because he's not he's not a human at all right like smith is a program yeah through and through he was never a human where thought, neo was a human. the thought is like yeah how does he infect a human mind right so he yeah also it's just a character we've barely seen like he's such a nothing <laughs> character like you barely recognize who he is and now he's right. supposed to be like the big final sh- like I reveal love, of the movie. I love this scene where he's going to stab Neo from behind <laughs> yeah. down the hallway. And then he's just stopped by somebody calling Neo's name. Right. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. It's done. Like he's not a threat at all. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> so th- this movie definitely has flaws. Yeah. But I think it's important in the trilogy especially. But I, it's important in the trilogy because it continues what neo's quest is but i think it's also creating a bigger world because Mm -hmm. the biggest thing i remember when i first watched reloaded which is i guess in middle school when it came out 2003 right yeah yeah no yeah you couldn't have been in middle school it had to be no i graduated 2006 i was in college oh i was in high school i remember watching it and being like oh this is gonna be awesome and actually thinking like this is kind of lame but now watching it as an adult and watching it as someone who has studied movies for a, a long time now, um, I realize like, oh, this is very, very important because it's such a it builds the world in such a way that the Matrix did not. Yeah. Because in the beginning, like I remember watching it and thinking, OK, so there's six people in this in Zion. That's about <laughs> it, right. It's it's Cypher. Well, it's the. It's the brother, Morpheus. I mean, it's that thing. And, is it better to see all of that and like have it all explained? Like, I think the brilliance of the first movie is you didn't need to have it all shown to you. It's the mystique, the mystery of it. That's yeah. true. But the fact that they did do it in the next two movies and 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 to to some success, I would I would mm-hmm. say, and it makes it such a bigger world. And and I now ha, you know has spawned the Animatrix and and Matrix Four and like. Yeah. Video games and I don't know, yeah. maybe comic books. I Does no anybody idea. else think that but Matrix Four could be just a different iteration of you know how there were six? That's my that's assumption. What I was thinking. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Or like the son of Neo or something that looks just like Neo. <laughs> no, I, I have no idea. I can't wait to see anything from that movie. Yeah, and just I'm like, just curious to see what it would be. Yeah, I I think I'll take it at face value. Like I don't think I will. I don't think I'll expect anything. Yeah, you know the Wachowskis are not both doing it. I forget which one is. Oh, right, only one of them. I think they sort of, they spent some of their goodwill after the Matrix. Um, (laughs) I thought Speed Racer was a lot of fun, but you know, like Jupiter Ascending is pretty god-awful, despite having good (laughs) visuals, and they haven't really been able to, I haven't watched Sense8, but I've heard it's very good. You know, like the Matrix reinvented the wheel when it came out. 
How many yeah. things aped the Matrix afterwards? So many. So many. Uh, it pretty much single-handedly established DVD as the new standard. I remember like they gave DVDs of the Matrix out with yeah. DVD players. <laughs> yeah. It was a package Plus, deal. <laughs> not only that, but action and special effects like that first movie still holds up whereas some of the that effects in movie. the second and third just do not. Yeah. Um, so we let's talk about the bad things in this movie because Ooh. there are tons. oh yes i'll talk there's about a lot yeah. of like plot holes or like things that aren't as, as explained like the frenchman and his twins which theory like i didn't realize this while watching it but reading up on it they're supposed to be agents from old iterations which makes oh. perfect sense to me whoa that's really? actually a cool idea yeah that he's like held on they to. should have made that clearer yeah, that that would yeah, well, I guess in the way they talk and in the way that they're like, they just seem like agents. The thing about The Matrix is that it's not just the three movies. There were multiple video games and the Animatrix spinoff, right. which and, explains stuff. And the video games and have content that's like important to the series. They do. The, there, yeah. there was a yeah. Enter the Matrix game was actually, they had live action scenes in it with Jada Pinkett and uh, the character Ghost. Niobe, yeah. Yeah, that tied directly into this movie. I guess uh, Lawrence Fishburne's not going to be in the fourth one. Aw. So, oh, interesting. Supposedly, they had the Matrix Online game, which was PC only. Morpheus dies in that game. Like, that's Whoa. a plot point in the game, which if you didn't huh. even know about that, uh, you would never know. <laughs> like, if you never played that game or looked it up, you would never know that. Yeah, that's crazy. Why isn't Morpheus yeah. in this movie? <laughs> Well, he's dead. Yeah, the Matrix is, is vast. But going back to the movie, yeah. the CGI is terrible. and It's a mixed bag. The CGI stunt sure. doubles. <laughs> I think it's terrible, I, with a capital T. And not just from like, you know, it was 2003, they didn't have the technology to do it, is that they shouldn't have done it if they didn't have the technology to do it. Because they did it, and because they like showed CGI faces and CGI mm-hmm. rubbery arms and limbs and stuff yeah it actually frustrates me because all those fight scenes were actually interesting to look at yeah until they cut to a cgi nonsense and i'm like oh this do you I think, think that's a- that we only <laughs> see that more now because we're used so. to seeing better and also our eyes are more trained to look out for things in movies because back then i thought i like i liked it i i still like it but I do, you know, you notice it. I yeah, remember it's... even back then people talking about that fight scene with Neo versus like the Hundred Smiths being right. yeah. very rubbery and fake. Um, the same thing yeah. happened in Blade 2 where they have CGI stunt doubles in that and it's got the same rubbery fake look to it. Just like Blade 2, I think Matrix Reloaded, it still kind of works, I think, because... The fight choreography is so damn good. Yeah, there. It, sometimes in the fight, it actually is really interesting. Yeah. And that's when you can tell, like, oh, this is real, and Keanu's fighting, and these are, I, I assume it's Keanu most of the time. Yeah, sometimes yeah. it's but, not, but, but yeah. But that's when it, when, it, when it goes to CGI, it really just, like, shuts down. It really is just, like, oh, it's so annoying. Also, <laughs> the reason that... Uh, they're all wearing sunglasses and their hair is all like nice and kind of like tight and tight. pulled back. It's probably to, to try to, to mask the CG stuff and also mask the uh, stunt, stunt doubles. doubles and stuff. Because it's a yeah. little weird that everyone's got sunglasses. Everyone's hair is back a certain way. And they all have a different pair of sunglasses. I really and I still can't believe that they, they did that fight with 100 Smiths and nary a one of them has their glasses fly off <laughs> the entire time. Yeah. They're, it's because they're yeah. rubber. Glued well, onto their face. It's because they're in the Matrix. I like it mainly for nostalgia reasons because I do think it's like super fun. I still enjoy watching all those fight scenes. Yeah. But it does, it reminds me why the first one is so brilliant. And like a prime example is that I found that the sequels, the second one especially, is just sort of like, here's a talking head scene where we're just going to throw a bunch of mysterious language at you and then we're going to give you a 10 minute super awesome action sequence right Mm -hmm. and then here's another talking head scene then here's another action sequence and it's just a exercise in like how crazy can the action sequences be which is cool on its own but in the first movie they are so relevant to the story the fight scenes and the visuals are really intertwined with his journey mm-hmm. of discovering his powers yeah. and like and, and they're they're relevant whether he can jump across 
you know, the skyscrapers is super relevant when he right. can finally dodge bullets is a super important plot point. So it isn't just yeah. crazy vi- like fights for the sake of them. They're essential to his journey. That's why I think the first one's so great and why the second one is just sort of okay. The first one has so much, <laughs> it, it has a little bit of it, but it does a lot more showing in that telling. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there is like that monologue with Morpheus and I yeah. think Trinity as well. And I mean, you ha- you have thing. to do that because of how wild that story is. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. the sequels do have like information dumps. Yeah. It goes on forever. I mean, the Merovingian and... does it. The architect does it. Um, yeah. The key maker see, those, does those it. Those scenes, I think they're just so compelling, especially like with the billion TV screens of Neo like yelling, <laughs> yeah. calling him as a fucker yeah, and all yeah. that shit. I think that's beautiful. Like, even though it is just like sit and listen to the story for five minutes. I wonder if those are previous the way iterations they do it, of the one. Oh, uh, yeah. I wonder on if the, the one is always looks like Neo or if they're. Yeah, because if it's yeah. like programmed that way, I don't know. It's interesting. Uh, you know, you talked about the first one being a better movie, and, and which I agree. But I think this is a better sci fi movie and that this is this is more of a traditional sci fi movie where. You are getting big scenes of of exposition and big scenes of like, this is how this world works. And the action scenes are not as good as the first. They're not. I wouldn't even consider them great. Like they're okay. I think they're passing in this movie because they're really like that whole car chase scene really didn't need to exist because no. it's still good. Though. They're just trying to it's say it's still damn human. good. <laughs> it's it's kind of cool. I think the twins are actually pretty cool, but it doesn't serve the plot it's just there to be an adrenaline yeah. rush yeah that's the thing yeah and and even with uh with when neo first meets the oracle he's supposed to pass this test by fighting uh uh what's his name seraph for no reason just to prove that he's the one yeah it's just <laughs> cool fight scene though yeah right i think that's that's the problem with the wakowskis is that they i think they just want to show that they just want to talk about these metaphors and theories and be philosophical but they know to actually make the movie the way warners wants them to do it is that they need these big budget scenes and whatnot mm-hmm. so they just kind of just slide them in and it was easier in the first one yeah because they would show more about his power. Well, they had less money not too. So much like, in the sequels. You know, mm-hmm. It's true. They, got, they probably had a pretty big budget to do what they wanted with two and three. Uh, there's that great scene with the council. I mean, this is the, this. I think this is the thesis statement of the movie. Is the counselor talks about you know he has machines in Zion that give them water and give them food and turn the lights on, but they're they're not harmful because we can control them. But can we really control them? Because if we turn them off, we would die. So they are part of us. They're yeah. symbiotic. And I think that's... That scene... That whole scene <laughs> is, is perfect. I couldn't help thinking that Neo seemed kind of stupid. Because it's like... Yeah. He's, he's, he's like falling for every you know leading question that the counselor has. It's like, are you not getting what he's going for here? Come on, man! Like you're yeah. smarter than this. That's my problem with Neo, and I, and I, and, and yeah, there's rumors that Will Smith was supposed to be the one, and later we heard Sandra Bullock was supposed to be. I think I would have. I think maybe maybe Keanu was the best choice out of those three, but I don't know. I think Sandra Bullock might have been interesting as the one or Trinity as the one. Oh, it was supposed to it didn't matter the gender. They're like just anybody from Speed. Just give me somebody from Speed. <laughs> I don't Dennis, care Hopper. Dennis Hopper. Dennis <laughs> Hopper could have been Cipher. <laughs> hey, we tell we we touched on this a little bit, but we should go back to it. And what do we all think of the giant Zion orgy slash party slash? <laughs> I already said the if you George Lucas it, that should be shortened. Shortened? Yeah, I, I know, forgot I, how long that dance sequence was. It, it is really long, man. and it is. I remember watching and thinking like, wait, Morpheus isn't the leader of this whole thing. <laughs> He's just like an he's just the leader of this one ship. Yeah. Like it kind of blew my mind like, oh, this is actually much bigger. Yeah. There's a bigger story to tell and that there's a general and there's a counselor and there's many people living seemingly underground. Yeah. And they're just like kind of like slaving it and not everyone like is on the same page with morpheus's theory yeah it isn't just like yeah exactly um, and yeah and they're like the small crew that's like no no we we're gonna be the ones to save us yeah yeah and there's like one kid that's like yeah you know neo can do it (laughs) 
and follows him around, which I think he's in the game as well. Isn't but, there an, an animatrix about him? Oh, maybe there is. There's there's a where he saves them. the best one on the animatrix is called the Final Flight of the Osiris. It's it involves another one of the ships. I think it ties into the first film, but it's like they're trying to get information for the Nebuchadnezzar. It's awesome. It's really good. It's like it's like Rogue One. Yeah, it it, it really is just like Rogue One. Well, I think we should probably move on to the third movie just because yeah. time wise <laughs> we've gotten to that point. I when I I remember when I was watching three of these three movies, I was thinking like we're definitely going to spend the most time on the Matrix, partly because it's part of a trilogy. Yeah. But because there's just so many questions about this movie. For sure, yeah. We need to talk about But okay, so Zach. So my pick is a little bit of a newer movie. I decided to, to pick something that I hadn't seen before and just purely based on sort of what people were saying about it and its ratings and give it a try. And so I picked 2018's Upgrade. What if I told you I could offer you something that would enable you to walk again? I call it STEM. Computer chip that has the potential to change everything. And that is directed by Lee Wanell, who famously starred in and wrote the original Saw, and has had a pretty pretty long career now of writing and directing. He collaborated with James Wan on like a ton of things, like Insidious and you know the Saw movies. Right. Um, he was mainly horror. Blumhouse guy for a while. He's in the Matrix Reloaded because they filmed that in Australia, and that's where he's from. Oh, I didn't realize. Yeah, who was he in Matrix? He's one of the guys in Zion towards the end of the movie. It's crazy. Looks like he's slated to direct, to direct it in Escape from New York. Uh, he's also oh, no and a Wolfman, but he most recently did The Invisible Man, which I enjoyed that. I don't know what you guys thought of that one. I haven't seen it yet, but I I have heard nothing but good things. It's not bad. It, it's got some interesting parts. I don't think it's a great movie, but I think it's interesting. But yeah, Upgrade. I really enjoyed it, and I'm glad that I picked it. The premise is somebody compared it to almost like um, Venom. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Oh, because of the person talking to him. And uh, yeah. So your lead character, Gray, is married. He's his wife, uh, Asha. And basically early on in the movie, they just sort of they get mugged and his wife dies and he gets paralyzed. And then a client of his offers him the ability to be able to walk again and sort of get his life back by implanting this device in him called stem yes the device is called stem not only will allow him to walk again and go back to his life but it'll improve him and give him the ability to do almost superhuman things um so he goes through with it i mean he basically wants to die but he wants to get revenge on these robbers that killed his wife i couldn't help thinking it actually would have been a good one for revenge thriller too yeah i was thinking the same thing it totally falls into that category but so essentially the movie is him trying to figure out who killed his wife and what the motive was i don't this is an interesting point i don't know if anybody else had the same thought but i would say about the time where he gets the implant put in is when i'm like oh yeah that's the guy that probably paid to have his wife killed did anybody else yeah make that connection pretty early on i mean that guy is so off kilter it's kind of like yeah obvious right it, it's aaron right aaron keen yeah aaron keen yeah so aaron is the the billionaire sort of the rich tech mogul who has this technology aaron is a weird guy from the get-go yeah it's almost like an obvious inevitability that it's going to turn out that he's actually the bad guy what i like about the movie is that it actually then at the end goes like two or three steps further than that yeah it made me really feel far more satisfied with the ending than i would have otherwise but the the movie like the plot is that he starts to hear stem in his head He's a basically like becomes right. this assistant. He sort of can have conversations with Stem and get his advice. And in some cases, Stem can just take over his body and um, just start fighting, attacking, just so killing. Cool. And that's the thing: the fight scenes in this movie are actually really awesome. Like, yeah, they're brutal and they're incredibly well shot. I mean, this is clearly a low budget movie, so they don't have like yeah the martial arts choreography of the Matrix. But I think what they do and what's interesting is how they film all of it. Yeah. Yeah. They keep doing this trick where they, they center the shot on like a limb mm-hmm. and then the whole, Everything the else. whole camera shifts around it. They st- basically and like stabilize 
a certain yeah, element. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. They stabilize like an arm, and then the arm punches the guy. You know, the movement, the camera movement, is the punch. Right, mm-hmm. which is a super effective way of giving the scenes a really cool vibe and getting yeah. inside his head. I think they use it one too many times in the movie, but I think it's I think it, it's effective in terms of like getting you pumped and flow of the movie. The actor that plays Gray, he must have like dance experience. Or like a background in dance or some sort of body movement because the way his body is moving is Mm -hmm. so precise. Whereas basically like from the neck up doesn't move and then his body is just doing these crazy contortions and things. Some of it is visual effects and some of it is stunt double, but it almost is like a breakdancing technique. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's really, really cool. Like I was really impressed with, with all that stuff and I feel it seemed like a lot of it was practical, at least the movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I... I think he's, uh, as I'm reading his bio right now, it just seems like he he's studied theater for uh, most of his life. Mm. And I think that that is like a big thing in movie. you know, being an actor, you need to control your limbs and, and your body. Yeah. Almost like a dancer would. And, and it made the fight scene so like dynamic. And like it added a level of humor to it. He'd just be like, don't get up, man. Don't get up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because this sort of reminded me of RoboCop. Yeah. Yeah, I think he was like that's that's where the humor came in where he uh sort of was like, you know, oh my god, that guy's head's flying off or whatever. Right. Yeah. And he's the one doing it and not realizing. And there's yeah. a there's just a simplicity to this story. Like it's not overly complicated. It really is just a a basic revenge kind of plot, but it's very satisfying yeah. and um and it's like a fun ride. Uh, would you say there's a B story? I guess there is one the cop but it really oh yeah, yeah the, cop the cop and the mom <laughs> like, which is <laughs> the mom yeah, that keeps which coming is, around i mean when those scenes have, i was just like who cares like, <laughs> <laughs> but this movie is is very different from ghost in the shell and and, and the matrix reloaded in that it's not it's not a, a cerebral and it is just like we're in this world there, here's his body modification now watch him do all these cool stunts mm-hmm. and there is like a simple like that's where the cyberpunkness is like, well, wait a second. This just looks cool, and this is cool. Yeah. And we can show you that as well. We don't have to get philosophical at well, all. Well, it does take a turn for yeah. the philosophical at the end. and Right, at the very, at the very end, end, almost tacked on. Yeah, and, and I guess we should get into that, and that's where I think it does share similarities with other, other the other two movies. Yeah. The reveal is that Stem is trying to take over Gray's body, and right. it wants it wants to be human it wants to be human it wants a biological body and he mm-hmm. it chose gray intentionally because gray doesn't like technology and doesn't have any body enhancements it's funny because similar to ghost in the shell everyone's got body enhancements like mm-hmm. criminals yeah. have guns implanted into their arms and stuff like that so it's rare to find a human that doesn't have any enhancements and that's what stem wanted so essentially about halfway through the movie aaron tries to shut down stem because gray's kind of misusing the body and it's all sort of an elaborate plan for stem to be rebooted with the ability to take over completely and not need permission from the user you don't realize it until the very end that aaron actually has been taken over by stem for some time and stem has been in control of the situation from the get-go so really who gray has been looking for the whole time is stem <laughs> stem is the thing that caused him his mugging yeah. and his girlfriend dying, right mm-hmm. right yeah but so at the very end uh they show that he sees his girl he wakes up from a quote-unquote dream and he sees his girlfriend and is like you were in the hospital you're blah 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 we're alive but in action in reality he's taken over by stem yeah so mm-hmm. he, stem has put him into a uh, a simulated experience yes mm-hmm. where yeah, he yeah. Just sees his- and in fact it was all part of basically like stem keeps saying if you fight me like you're gonna break your brain um he keeps warning yeah. him and you know of course gray is trying to fight him because he doesn't want to kill the cop he doesn't want stem to take over actually what stem wants is for him to break his brain because once he does that then Stem can just take over completely. And then, you know, Gray's is going to be living inside of his mind. It is kind of a happy ending, though. It's Is it? He gets, <laughs> he gets to be with his wife again. Yeah, but it's all an illusion. And in fact, yeah, it's, it Stem matter. won. Like, Stem Stem <laughs> beat Gray. He beat Aaron. Yeah, he beat everybody. Villain. Stem wins and Gray wins. The, <laughs> the villain won. 
because the Gray, villain wins. Gray wanted to die anyway. I know, but and... he didn't actually get his revenge on the true killer. Yeah. Well, I guess the the, the uh. part that's not happy is that Stem seemingly will just kill everyone and take over the. Stem, I mean, I don't know. I don't, yeah. That's the only problem. Like, what is Stem's mission? Well, he wanted I, a bio. Besides no. wanting he wanted his body. to, you know, mesh. He wanted to meld his intelligence with a biological body to be sort of whole. And he does he that. He wanted a penis. Let's and be then, honest. And then, <laughs> and then do what with that? That's though? a good question. Maybe have sex. Maybe there'll be actually there's going to be an upgrade series. So maybe we'll find yeah. the answer the, out to that question. A, a sequel or a TV show? It's a TV Supposedly series. Supposedly a series. It might be a reimagining. It might not even be a, the same characters of the same world. But I was struck that like I did see the similarities in the Matrix movie and Ghost in the Shell, especially of um, trying to sort of like unite humanity with machine. So there's something to that. It's not just that technology is everywhere. It's that oftentimes technology wants to combine with humanity or, or take over for humanity, like in the case of the Matrix. You know, mm. It's ultimately doing more harm than good. There's always an element of like we need technology too. That is the question in in I think in almost every cyberpunk movie, uh, even in Upgrade, which is a bit more simplistic, but still, you know, questions that. Yeah, definitely, it is definitely a more simplistic movie. But uh, like I said, I expected that movie to end with just him getting revenge on on uh, Aaron. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I appreciate that it took it. <laughs> they took it three more steps, and the fact that they took it that far was. Uh, I enjoyed that, and I didn't see it coming. I didn't see it coming either, right. and even now I'm like, well, why, why do that? No, it makes sense <laughs> to me. Don't... It makes sense, doesn't it? Like, I, I it makes sense to why he, like, why he picked that person, mm-hmm. but why even need a human? Like, why not? Like, it's not like, like in Space Odyssey, it's not like Hal ever wanted to be inside a human. He had the ship, and he wanted to kill everyone. Like that to me makes sense mm-hmm. because that's the that that was his mission to you know. Well, it, the same question could be asked, I guess, about the puppet master, right? Yeah. Well, I think the puppet master wanted to specifically wanted to be with Major because he the, that that symbiotic relation. Like it wasn't world, it wasn't like world domination or anything. He it wanted to like, evolve, right? Isn't there a whole thing about he they can't um, procreate and and cause right. allow for v- variety variation. Right, but he, mm-hmm. he he can now be like this new being. Right, like it was her, about it was about evolving, and I think it I think it's the same thing for Stem. I think Stem, but I think has but, a consciousness similar to the puppet master, and yeah. I think he yeah, wants yeah, to evolve yeah. as well. But it, to me, it's like that's not evolve. That's actually a hindrance because now you're stuck in this person's body. That's not you know he's not like immortal or anything. No, and another question I had as I was explaining this movie to. Jess, my wife, she was like, if it was like a product on the market, would every STEM be a different consciousness? Is STEM like universal? Like if he's in more than one body? I feel like body? it's a program like Alexa. I think it's more like um, the thing in, in the Avengers. What's that? Jarvis. Jarvis <laughs> where it is like a it thing. It can be everywhere. It's, only a, it's like a supercomputer that has its own conscious. So, so it's, like a, it's like a server somewhere that's going out to all the stems and different people. So stem is well, the Well, are there other thing. stems? Well, I was just thinking because it's... It's There's only one stem. Well, no, but it's also yeah. in Aaron. And it's, it's still in him, right? It's still controlling him, isn't I it? I don't think so. Isn't that because he's not doing it by his own volition, he's doing it because Stem is making him do it. Aaron's not in control. Stem has been in control since the first time we've seen him. But then Stem's also in the new body. See, this is where I feel like the movie needs to have the, <laughs> the sit-down architect. <laughs> because I didn't, I didn't quite get that part. Who was the right. guy that also had movements just as, just as good as Oh, Stem? the bounty. The lead mercenary. Yeah, the mercenary that killed his wife. Who can who can sneeze and send nano machines? Yeah. Nano machines with little little tiny <laughs> knives. <laughs> That's a little less believable than an arm gun. <laughs> yeah, that was a pretty cool fight, actually. That those two fighting each other was that was a good one. Yeah, I think what I like about this movie is it is kind of a it's clearly a, a B movie. You know, mm-hmm. it's not a huge budget. It's got a good straightforward plot, but it's not going to like break your brain in any way. There's nothing that philosophical about it. Mm-hmm. It's not like it is like a B movie 
Ghost in the Shell. Um, like, what if Ghost in the <laughs> Shell is just kind of a B-grade action movie? There's a lot about it that's super cool, like the arm guns and the stem controlling his movements and things like that. But I, I think the more we think about it, the more we're picking up <laughs> the the plot threads that don't exist. Right. Are, are unraveling, so, I mean. <laughs> that's my trouble with the movie, is that they don't explain it. And I think that would, be, like, it's not one of those things where, like, the Matrix or Ghost in the Shell explain too much. In this, it's like I, that would be very important to know if he can be in two different people, <laughs> and if he and and revealing that he that he controls Aaron would make you know like oh well show me signs of that throughout the movie because I know they do they cut back to things yeah they do they just show the events over but there's nothing that's like oh see like we're hinting oh, at this in any no way. they do they're um well he says like oh he was in my ear telling me to say. Uh, what would your wife want you to do and um, manipulate him that way? And then you're right. Yeah. There's also, they flash to the thing with his, they show his eye and it has that robotic eye look that kind of d- indicates that, right. that he's right. at least got some upgrades to him. I think Chris is right in saying this is like, uh, this is like a more fun B rated, I guess not B. Would you say B level? B level. Yeah. B grade. <laughs> B level movie. B grade. Yeah. I mean, to me, um, it, it, it reminds me of like the B grade Matrix equilibrium. <laughs> that I, I feel like this is on that same level where it is kind of adapted from the same material in a way, but low budget, yeah. doing its own thing, sort of. We should start talking about some honorable mentions. Yeah. What movies should we? I mean, first of all, the rest of the Matrix trilogy, obviously. Right. And of course, you could do Blade Runner, um, Blade Runner, the sequel. Blade Runner, obviously. But Equilibrium is up there, Existence. although I think I have problems with that. Existence is is up there. I, I sort of wish I picked it, but I can't not talk about the Matrix. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Existence is great. Video drone would probably be on there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's a bunch of Spielberg movies. Minority Report, Ready Player One. Oh, yeah. AI, AI in some way. Mm-hmm. AI, yeah. Um, I, I don't think he, I think he misses the mark each time. But I think Minority Report has the most interesting concept of all of them. I think that uh, Ready Player One is certainly a fun movie to watch. But that's like, Mm -hmm. that's just cyberpunk to lean into like nostalgia. That's not like an authentic cyberpunk story. And then I think we mentioned Hackers earlier. Although, is it cyberpunk or is it just? It is. I don't know. I've actually never seen it. I mean, it, it it appears on the list, but you know, there's not much futuristic about it. No, it's just really, uh, it's really just okay. So maybe stylistically, again, like everyone's yeah. dressed sort of cyberpunk. I think cyber-punky. the hacking, the internet stuff. Yeah. Twelve Monkeys is a good oh, one. Oh yeah. Robocop. I do think there's Robocop for sure. Uh, um, both Judge Demolition Dredd movies. Man. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, Demolition Man. Demolition um, Man. I would I would have picked that one. It's such a fun movie. I love that movie. That is a fun one. Uh, also nonsensical yeah. to some extent. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of video games that dabble into this. Uh, Tons. The best one, I think, is Final Fantasy VII. I thought you were going to say for video games like Bioshock or Half-Life or something. Bioshock is a, is a, is a good one. I mean, Metal Gear Solid has aspects of cyberpunk. Deus Ex is like the cyberpunk game until Cyberpunk 2077 comes out. Um, <laughs> there's also... Um, <laughs> Watch Dogs. Which Watch is... Dogs, yeah. I've got one more oddball recommendation. Ooh, okay. You know what's interesting? There's a lot of cyberpunk that came out in 1995 for some reason. Huh. You had Hackers, you had Ghost in the Shell, Johnny Mnemonic, and then the one thing that probably no one thinks about because it's not a visual medium, David Bowie released an album called Outside. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm. It's a really cool, interesting album because... The whole thing tells this cyberpunk detective story. I mean, that's hmm. it's awesome to listen to it. There's, you know, the songs tell the story. And then there's also these kind of monologues where he plays different characters oh, wow. in between the songs. You know, just being a David Bowie fan and kind of like, that seems like an aesthetic he kind of adopts sometimes. But that's that's a great album to listen to. It's not one that people often think about. I don't think it was like a huge critical or commercial success, but it's got mm. some pretty interesting stuff on it. That's really cool. I did not so know that existed. That's an interesting one. Yeah. yeah. I just remembered, I think I saw on some lists, um, Scanner Darkly. Oh, yeah. Which I, That's another thing, too, is like Philip K. Dick yeah. is 
a lot of this stuff. Scanner Darkly, uh, Minority Report, Blade Runner, all these things were Philip K. Dick. Uh, um, there's one that I wanted to mention that I actually haven't seen, but I hear is like the m- perfect movie is Akira. Oh, I've never mm, seen it. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then like Elysium and. Oh, right. Elysium. Almost anything that. Um, oh, shit. What's the director of Elysium? Neil Blomkamp. Yeah. He did District 9. All of his movies. Oh, yeah. I think all of his movies are probably. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. I think we've uh, we've covered a lot, a pretty good wide range of of movies there. There's so many. Yeah, there's, there's so, so many. many. Yeah. But it's uh, it's more prevalent than you think. Oh, for sure. When you find really good ones like like The Matrix or or, or whatever, like it really can like open your mind to things. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. so the people that aren't that don't watch these movies, just try one <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, yeah. and really think about what the questions that they're asking because it, 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 you know. It is important. Mm-hmm. Thought and provoking. I'm, all right. Well, I think we should wrap this up. I think we really, I think we fully covered this one. So that wraps up this episode. Uh, thank you for listening, Sam. Or where can they find us online? You can find us on Facebook at a few good movies pod, and on Instagram at a few good movies pod, and then on Twitter we're a few good movies p, and on YouTube we're a few good movies pod. Or you can email us at a few good movies pod at gmail.com and chris what do we got up uh next week what is next week well it'd be a mi- it'd s- be a mini episode am i doing that don't they know <laughs> by now gotta, it's episode eight gotta, god damn you gotta it tee those up man uh next week we'll have another mini episode where we're gonna talk about what we've been watching just kind of a loose conversation you know what we've been playing yeah, or reading huge. and then uh we'll introduce our ninth episode all right well that about wraps it up thanks again for listening and we will see you next time on a few good movies happy thanksgiving (laughs) bye (laughs) see ya